Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, if you've ever heard somebody say that the Holy Spirit is God the Father in spirit and that Jesus is God the Father in Son, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below. Don't forget to like the video and ring the bell. You've been taught modalism. Yeah, the, I, the, oh, man, the, the, I would note that much of evangelicalism and large swaths of the charismatic movement are functionally modalistic. And if you don't know what that is, I'll explain it as we go. But the basic gist behind modalism is that uh, you believe in one God, so it's a Unitarian approach to God, but God manifests himself in different ways. It's kind of like wearing hats. So you know, someday God puts on the, the Father hat, and the, someday he puts on the Son hat, other days he puts on the Spirit hat, and that's not how that works at all. As, uh, as they would say over at, there at Lutheran Satire, that's modalism, Patrick. Yeah, that's, that's modalism. That's not, not at all how God has revealed himself. The biblical doctrine of the Trinity is that there are one God, three persons, and, th that th and the idea then is, is that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Not, yet there's not three gods, there's only one, and yet the Father is not the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and the Holy Spirit's not the Father, and the Father is not the... You, you get the idea. We'll explain it. Uh, we'll do a little uh, biblical explaining, if you would, and I'm going to give you a resource that you can use to help kind of understand how God has revealed his nature in Scripture, and we are to believe it. We don't have to understand it, because the doctrine of the Trinity is not a doctrine that, that makes sense to our, 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 our puny uh, mortal minds, if you would, but it's not contrary to logic. Instead, the idea here is that God has revealed this, so we believe what God has revealed about himself. We confess that to be true, and it's not necessary that we understand how the nature of God works, just that this is, is the, the way in which his nature is revealed to us. So the idea, you pay attention to how God has revealed himself in his word. Otherwise, you end up making a God that conforms to your reason, and a God that conforms to your reason is an idol, and it can't save you. So, yeah, all that being said, we're heading over to uh, Cornerstone Church in San Diego, uh, California. Pastor Sergio de la Mora is, is uh, preaching a sermon titled, Break Your Piñata, and <laughs> this was <laughs> delivered on Cinco de Mayo of 2019, and this thing goes wrong in so many ways that I had to pick one. <laughs> I almost feel like I could take another crack at this. And at this exact same sermon, I can I can take two or three other cracks at it. And, uh, and we just wouldn't run out of ways in which he completely deviates from God's word. This is like a case study in absurdity and false doctrine. And ex this is like a case study in what not to do when you're preaching. So let's get to it. Here's uh, Sergio de la Mora and break your, Amen. break your pinata. You remain standing, take out your Bibles with me and go to Mark chapter 14. I want to read this verse of scripture with you. Mark chapter 14, I want to preach a message called break your pinata. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't done one. Of, I haven't done that since I was six. Yeah, my parents actually. I grew up in Southern California, so you know, I I got to break a pinata for one of my birthdays. Six, I was six. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, but hey, you know, I did it. I, I've broken a pinata before. Actually, I took a couple couple of whacks at it, and I really didn't bring it down. It was other people from the party who were more capable at like really opening that thing up but that's a different story altogether so presently i am not in i, I do not own a piñata so um how many of you have never broken a piñata in your life let me see your hand 
You have never in your life broken a piñata. <laughs> Piñatas do not appear in scripture. Just saying. Are you serious? Okay. How many of you have broken a piñata? How many of you broke something that you thought was a piñata? I'm going to talk to you about the spiritual significance of a piñata today. <laughs> there is no spiritual significance of a piñata. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Read the Bible with me. Mark chapter 14. We'll start in verse 3. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar. Well, with a beautiful piñata, let's just say. No. An alabaster jar is not a piñata. Of expensive perfume made of the essence of nard. She broke open the jar. She broke the piñata. No. No. <laughs> no. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't work. This is not a good illustration. And poured the perfume over Jesus' head. Yeah. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. Couldn't have been sold for years of wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Tell the person next to you, leave me alone. Why would I tell the person next to me, leave me alone? They're not touching me. You know, I, I'm not in this text. So you'll note he's doing something really weird. And like I said, this thing goes wrong in so many different ways. Um, in fact, I, you know, if I were to just look for the ways in which it goes right, we could probably do a just a brief little video, maybe a minute or two long. You know, this is, we're going off the rails all over the place here. It's like trying to herd cats. Yeah. Come on, tell them again. Tell them again. Just say, give me some room. Tell them, give me some room. I'm about to break my piñata right now. <laughs> give me some room here, man. Leave me alone, I'm gonna break my piñata. Don't you need to be blindfolded? And the Bible says, why criticize her for doing such a good thing? You always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed as we are doing on Cinco de Mayo 2019 at Cornerstone Church of San Diego. One more time, give them praise. Come on, Cornerstone. You may be seated today. Um, in your notes, I, I placed an excerpt of the book I've been reading. This book is called The Release of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right, so uh, th this is no no number two. You're supposed to exegete the text. And he, no joke, in the sermon quotes extensively from this book he's been reading as if it's the Bible. Yeah, that's a no no. Yeah, that's a no no. Yeah, I mean, if you want to quote a scholar to help you rightly understand a text, that's one thing. But <laughs> the release of the Holy Spirit book. Um, this is not a, an exegesis on the text he just read. And Sergio here keeps calling that alabaster jar a piñata. It's not a piñata, man! Um, I think it's important that we all grow in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God the Father in spirit. Oh. You see, and th this is the reason I picked this particular problem here. Because this is the most egregious. You get this wrong, you're believing in a false god. 
So let me back that up and let's listen carefully to what he just said, because this is not the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. This is modalism. The Holy Spirit is God the Father in spirit. No, he's not. The Holy Spirit is God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was God the Father in Son. No, God the Son is God the Son, not God the Father. Now, <sighs> yeah, let's, um, we're going to zero in on this issue right here. Because that right there, that, that's modalism, Patrick. That's, that's a heresy. And if believing in the modalistic God is not the God of, of Scripture. That's not what God has revealed his nature to be. Uh, believing in the God of modalism puts you outside of Christianity. So it's important that you get this right. All right, so let's do this. We're going to start with, shall we, a, a graphic that is helpful. All right, now understand, this is just useful in explaining how the Trinity works. And, um, and this is this, you, you just don't push too hard on these things, but you get the idea. So let me zoom in on this. So here's the idea, this upside-down, triangle-ish kind of thing here. In the center, it says God. There is only one God, and we'll talk about this from Scripture in a minute. There is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. That, that's the reason you see you know, those bars going right to the middle. So it says Spirit is God, Father is God, Son is God. This is most certainly true. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But here's the thing. The Father is not the Son. You know, so, for instance, when Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, he goes into the water, and John the Baptist baptizes him, and what happens? God the Holy Spirit descends on Christ in the form of a dove, mm -hmm, and the voice of the Father is born from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here, all three persons of the Trinity appear at the same time, and they're in their persons, you can, you can talk about them in ways that you make them distinct from each other. So the Spirit is God, the Son is God, the Father is God, the Son is God, uh, but the Spirit is not the Son. The Father is not the Son, the Father is not the Spirit. The, the Son is not, you, you get the idea, Okay. So the, this will help you kind of keep all that right. So when Sergio de la Mora said that uh, the Spirit is God the Father in spirit, no, that's modalism. And when he said that Jesus is God the, is God the Father in Son, again, no, that's modalism. Now, I know this seems confusing, and it's a little hard to track with. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a link to this resource and the name of the resource is the biblical basis of the doctrine of the Trinity. This was put together years ago by uh, Robert Bowman. Robert Bowman, this is a fellow who was a, a researcher who uh, used to work uh, with Walter Martin years ago. He would write books on the doctrine of the Trinity against the Arian heresy in the form of the Jehovah's Witnesses cult. And, uh, and so he put together this extensive resource called The Biblical Basis of the Doctrine of the Trinity. We're not going to go through it in its entirety, but we'll put a link to this. And so the biblical basis of the doctrine of the Trinity begins with this idea that Scripture is explicitly clear that there is only one God. There is only one. There are not three. There is only one. One And let's take a look at those texts. For instance, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. Here's what it says. You are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. All right? you're looking for a text that says there's only one God, that's the one. And you'll note, no gods are created, no, no gods are formed before him, none after him. He is the only God that is and ever will be. 
I mean, that's as clear as it gets. Isaiah 44, verses 6 through, uh, six through 8 says, Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yahweh Savaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And you'll note that this is, sounds a lot like what Jesus says in the book of Revelation. I am the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Right, exactly. Who is like me, Isaiah says. Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will, and, and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you it from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. No gods before him, none after him. He is the only rock that is. Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am Yahweh. There is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. Isaiah 45, verse 14. Uh, it, It says, Thus says Yahweh, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabaeans, men of of." Stature shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God beside him. Isaiah 45, 21. So declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together who told this long ago, who declared it of of old. Was it not I, Yahweh? And there is no other God beside me a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So um, you you get the point. And so all of these passages then are in section one. There is only one God. So this is most certainly true. Scripture explicitly teaches there is only one God. Before God, there was no God formed. There will no be no gods after him. There are no other deities except for the one, right? Now, all of that being said, then God the Father himself is called God. For instance, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and you'll note I'm in that section of the document put together by Robert Bowman. Ephesians 1, verse 3, in the King James says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, in heavenly places. And so he goes on to explain all of the different places from the scriptures where God the Father is called God. And here's the thing. In in my years of doing counter-cult work, I have yet to run across a single person who denies that the Father is God. Yeah, that just does that. It's like that theological animal doesn't exist. At least I've never run across it. But if you know somebody who says, I don't believe the Father is God, well, here's the, here's the clear passages that say, the Father is God. Now, where all the action is at, by the way, then, is regarding Jesus Christ. And that is, over and again, people deny that Jesus is God. Or, you know, in the case of modalists, they say, well, the, God the Son is just a hat that... Uh, that, that, that the one true God puts on from time to time, which actually modalism doesn't make any sense because now my, my question would be like, all right, so when Jesus was being baptized, who was doing the speaking from heaven? Was Jesus throwing his voice? Was he engaging in ventriloquism? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But by the way, T.D. Jakes believes in modalism. He's a modalist. He's, he denies the doctrine of the Trinity, and I don't care what they did at Elephant Room 2, he flat out still would not confess the doctrine of the Trinity. And, you know, for all of his claims that his doctrine has shifted, he still teaches modalism. Yeah, that's what he teaches and believes and confesses. All right, so we're going to take a look at passages that explicitly say that Jesus is God, and we'll note then that this is, you know, going to create an interesting conundrum for us, but we'll note that this is what the Scriptures say. So in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, En arche, en halagas, kai halagas, en proston theon, kai theos en halagas, which is Greek to you, but translated says, In the beginning was the Word, and watch what it says, The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So how many gods are there? There's only one. 
But you'll note that the Logos is with God, and the Logos is God. This is kind of how the mystery of the Trinity works. So you'll note then that God the Father is called God, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he is also called God. Yet there is only one God. And Jesus prays to the Father, and he is sent by the Father, which means Jesus isn't the Father. Right? Right. Now, how does that work? I don't know. I have no clue how it works. I just know that that's what God has revealed about his nature in Scripture. Now, John chapter 20, verses uh, 24 through 29, very important text. So uh, if you remember, when Jesus rose from the grave, uh, he appeared to his disciples in the upper room, uh, but Thomas missed the first meeting. And so on the following Sunday, Jesus appears again amongst them, and, uh, and Thomas, when he missed the, the first meeting, uh, the first appearances of Christ, said he's not going to believe unless he puts his hands in, in, the, in, the, in the, Jesus' side and touches the, the nail marks in his hands. And so Jesus now, on you know, the second Sunday after the, uh, after the resurrection, appears in the upper room, and here's what it, it says. I'll start in verse 24 for our context. Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, we've seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see his hands in the marks of the nails and place my finger in the marks of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, and the Greek here is wonderful, Hakurios mu kai theos mu, my Lord and my God. You are the Lord of me, you are the God of me. And Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas for this, because here Thomas confesses that Jesus is his Lord and his God. And that's exactly who Jesus is. Remember what it says in Colossians 2, that in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. So, Jesus said, you have believed because you've seen me. I'm blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. All right, so you'll note that Jesus praises him for believing, and he says to those who believe the same confession, that Jesus is Lord and God, that they are blessed even though they have not seen Jesus. That would be you and I. Now, Acts chapter 20, verse 20, the Apostle Paul in his great farewell address to the pastors in the congregations in the church of Ephesus, you know, he, he says something quite fascinating regarding the blood of God. Here's what he says. So he says, you know that how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except for that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value or as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore... I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And then he says this to the pastors of the churches in Ephesus. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And of course, you have to ask the question, when did God bleed on the cross? So this is another reference that clearly teaches that Jesus Christ is God. You see, we were purchased, bled for, died for. We were purchased by the very blood of God. And God normally doesn't have blood, but because of the incarnation, Jesus Christ... God the Son in human flesh, God now has blood. 
you get the idea. That's kind of the point of the text. Now, Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 13, says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, and training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so you note here the Apostle Paul says of Jesus that he is our great God and Savior. So again, working through the texts, uh, you know, basic concept is, is that Scripture is explicitly clear there is only one God. The Father is clearly called God. The Son is called God. How many gods are there? One. And also, by the way, the Holy Spirit is also called God. And here's one passage that will bear that out. But again, Robert Bowman's resource, again, will be available in the description of today's episode of Fighting for the Faith. So be sure to grab the link and then, you know, work through all the biblical texts that Robert Bowman has laid out, and you'll see that it, it you know, this is clearly what the Bible teaches as far as what God has revealed regarding his nature. So third person of the Trinity, then, is the Holy Spirit, and this is the account of Ananias and Sapphira. It says in Acts chapter 5, verse 1, a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, they sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, brought only a, a, only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet, which, by the way, is not a problem. The problem was is that he was putting on the pretense that he was bringing the entire sum uh, for which he sold the property, and in, by doing so, he's lying. So Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So who did Ananias lie to? Ananias lied to none other than the Holy Spirit himself. Okay, so And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart, that you, uh, you have not lied to man, but you have lied to God? So you'll note then that Acts chapter 5 says that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, and by doing so, he lied to God. So, Father is God. He's called God. The Son, Jesus Christ, is explicitly said to be God. The Holy Spirit is said to be God. And yet there are not three gods. There is only one God. And so I'll come back then to our, the, the, you know, the, the, the idea here you know, from the graphic that the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. We showed you the biblical texts that bear that out. They are, and yet there's only one God. Scripture's clear. And the Father is not the Spirit. No, the, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The Son is not the Father. No, and the Son is not the Spirit. And so how do you say, well, I don't understand. I understand it. I don't understand how it works either. But this is what God has revealed about himself. So Sergio de la Mora it just, I mean, got it way, way badly wrong when he said what he said. And uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me back this up just a smidge, and I want you to hear it again because you can see that this is, this is so bad. I mean, <laughs> he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. So 15 seconds, here we go. Release of the Holy Spirit. Um, I think it's important that we all grow in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God the Father in spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He's God, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. Jesus was God the Father and Son. No, he's not. Jesus is God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity, in human flesh, by the way, too. Yeah, let me give you a resource that if you can get your hands on, uh, it would be helpful for you also. Uh, back in the day when, uh, when the Christological heresies were ravaging the church, you think of the modalists, you think of the Arian heresy, uh, then you th uh, Nestorianism and other uh, heresies that just rock the church. Uh, in the 4th uh, or 5th century, 
um, they, uh, the, the Christian church put together a creed called the Athanasian Creed. It was named after Ath- Athanasius of Alexandria, the great defender of the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, as ponderous a, as a confession as it is, it correctly lays out what the Scriptures say. And so uh, and it uses a word that we're all really uncomfortable with, and the word is Catholic. But the Catholic, Catholic means universal. And notice it's a small c, not a ca- capital c. It's not talking about Roman Catholicism. It's talking about the universal faith that is to be believed and confessed throughout all time and in all nations until Christ returns. So here's what it says. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold to the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will undoubtedly perish eternally. And so the Catholic faith is this. We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons, which is what uh, Sergio de la Mora did. He confused the persons, nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, the Holy Spirit is another, but the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one. Uh, The glory equal, uh, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. Created. Now, let me, let me do this because I can tell that I made it just a little bit too small there. There we go. And we'll come over here. So the Father, infinite. The Son, infinite. The Holy Spirit, infinite. The Father, eternal. The Son, eternal. The Holy Spirit, eternal. And yet there are not three eternals. There's only one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, then, The Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty, and yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. This is what Scripture teaches. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, and yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord— so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the trinity in unity and the unity in trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the trinity. And then it goes on to talk about the Incarnation, which is, use, which is also useful. It's also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the Incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages. He is man, born of the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God, perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh. Equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. Those who've done good will enter into eternal life, those who've done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic, or the universal faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. 
So there you go, Athanasian Creed. Um, and uh, I yeah. see if I can find a copy that we'll put in the description of this installment of Fighting for the Faith so that you can look at it. And the reason why that document, that creed, is so helpful is because it very carefully says the exact same thing as Scripture. One God, three persons, not three gods, but one. And, uh, and that's what the Bible reveals. And so, again, the resources for you for this installment of Fighting for the Faith will be uh, Robert Bowman's The Biblical Basis of the Doctrine of the Trinity, which I've barely scratched the surface of, but you got the shape of how the Bible reveals the nature of God and the nature of the Trinity, and, uh, and this will, it's a useful, useful resource for those who want to go deeper in it. And then we'll throw a link up to a PDF version of the Athanasian Creed also in the description so that you can download that as well. Hopefully you found this helpful, and like I said, Sergio de la Mora's sermon goes so far off the rails in so many different ways, we decided to just pick on the one where it clearly shows he does not understand the doctrine of the Trinity at all, and what he was, what he was literally saying uh, was none other than modalism, and modalism is a heresy that cannot save. It's a heresy that has you believing in a false god, a, a god that is reasonable, but not the god who is, so... Now, if you found this helpful, all the information on how you can share this video is down below in the description. And of course, if you'd like to make a, a, you know, a contribution to support the ongoing work and mission of Fighting for the Faith, we truly can use your help uh, as uh, YouTube is uh, you know, making our lives interesting. They've been demonetizing a lot, not every one of them, but many of our videos now. And that is definitely cutting into our uh, resources so that uh, you know that we can keep bringing you this important outreach. Now, uh, so if you don't, haven't already joined our crew, click on the link to join our crew, where you can make a one-time contribution or become a patron on Patreon. And let me thank you for your support. We truly cannot do what we are doing here without it. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and His vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Mm -hmm.